Well, this is a quick demo of installing Ravel and using it for my patrons. Uh, first of all, a quick mea culpa. Russell did send me a version in time to release on my birthday, but I managed to either miss the email or misinterpret the text and I didn't see it. Uh, so now I'm making amends. So the belated birthday present calls it moi rather than Ravel. So here is the, uh, once you click on the link, once, once the uh, post is up, that's the link you'll get. If you click on that, you will find you then get a choice to download. Uh, an MSI file, which is Microsoft install file. <coughs> Go through the usual waiting for the uh, file to download. You can see it turning up over here, uh, 26 seconds. Um, yeah, so what I'll do in this uh, video is get to the very first point of bringing a Ravel in, uh, and then I'll make another video, which I'll link in a second post, where I show how to use that to uh, uh, actually analyze the data that I've imported. But the first thing is getting data into the program. We don't yet support typing data into a spreadsheet type file. We will do that at a later point. At the moment you have to download a file in CSV format from somewhere uh, on your computer because at the moment our Earl loading is not working all that well. Anyway, so I've downloaded. I've, that's enough waffle to get me to this point. You can see it's turned up over here. So I click on this and go for install. And I'm just hoping part of the install process is covered by my screen recorder now because part of it is actually the uh, 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 Microsoft Windows blanks the screen and asks you to confirm. Are you serious that you want to uh, record this? So I've done that. I'll let this uh, come in now and choose finish. And then just to make sure I'm right, I'll just check and see that I've got anything recorded and then I'll keep on going. It didn't actually record the section with the screen blanks out. That will happen. Uh, when it blanks, just choose the yes for doing the install. By the way, one of my patrons made a comment about he's afraid, he or she is afraid of getting viruses. Guaranteed no viruses in this program. It's, uh, it comes straight from the source. Uh, Russell has uh, what's called checksums to make sure that there are no code can be inserted uh, when he's doing the compile. So we know this is 100% free of viruses. Uh, and if you get it from anywhere else, you might be in trouble, but that the particular site you can see here is clean. Okay, having installed it, and under Windows 10, it'll turn up as the first program recently added. So here's Ravel. Uh, you can see it's the same interface as Minsky. In fact, in the about window, we talk about a Minsk about Minsky rather than Ravel. That's because Ravel is built on top of Minsky. Minsky is open source, free, uh, and code is available, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Ravel is, a, is a proprietary. Uh, the, the actual Ravel code goes into a, a, a non-source uh, available uh, uh, DLL, the Dynamic Link Library. And uh, so, and we'll be, as I said, at some stage releasing it commercially. So the basic flow of, of activities when you're working with Ravel is first of all to import data, then to attach that data to a Ravel, and then to chart or, or, or uh, uh, put a sheet up showing the data. By the way, the sheet is by far the most primitive part of our interface at the moment, or attach it to a variable uh, where you can do uh, further work to uh, analyze it, uh, do mathematics on it, and so on, and I'll show that later in the video. Now choose import. I'll go to, as I said earlier, the Earl doesn't work all that well right now. So download and load a CSV file on your computer. And one of the files I regularly use is by the Bank of International Settlements. And this file uh, <coughs> gives you information on the frequency of the data, it's all quarterly. Uh, the country that's borrowed using both the code and the name, uh, a code for the borrower, the borrowing sector, again, uh, rep repetition there. Uh, and then all the quarters uh, for the data starting back in 1940 Q2 and finishing up in 2020 Q3. And then the data is stored on rows after that. So you choose open and you see our import window. I'll just make this a bit wider. Uh, and increase the column width so you can see the names more clearly. And th these first two fields, all the data is quarterly. You don't need the code or the queue, just get rid of them. Uh, and then this is a string for the borrowers, and this is repeated all the way through. Here's a string, uh, which is what the person entering the data would type, 4T. That would then give them emerging market economies as the actual string. Uh, so I get rid of that, and I get rid of all the same codes here, which are just codes for what's actually stored in text elsewhere. Uh, I'd like to edit the actual text in the entries as well rather than these very verbose entries, but that's going to have to wait for a later version as well. That's the first, first stage of bringing it in. The second is that the data is actually stored on each row, 
So this is going to, the first row here is going to be emerging markets borrowing by the non-financial sector from all sectors rather than just banks, recorded at market value as percentage of GDP adjusted for breaks, and then the entire row will be that particular data type. Now, if you are bringing in trends, uh, what, what, as a result of that, by the way, each row is unique. And that's why we say when you bring in, if you find a duplicate key, uh, then show there's a problem. But you might be bringing in transactional data and you have data which is on a you know, per day or per second uh, basis and you want to aggregate that to a day or a week or a, a month, then you can choose to aggregate the data as it comes in by taking a sum, a product, a minimum, maximum or an average. Uh, the most obvious ones would be a sum uh, or an average, I expect, people bringing in the data. We don't need to do that here. We, every data row is going to be unique. Uh, each each, each uh, data row combined with the name of the dimension over here. And we have to then generically define all these columns over here as quarters. So that's Q2 1940, Q3 1940. They're all quarters um, and they're all about time. So I type quarter here as the time dimension. Say so that it is a time type and then I can choose from a drop down uh, a template that's the same as that. So that's the year, a dash, uh, the letter Q and the number of the quarter. So having done all that, I choose import and then Rabble creates a very verbose uh, file, a parable, uh, a parameter name because that's the name of the CSV file. So you can edit that and I'll just call this, go back up here and call this BIS data. And uh, by the way, that's the formatting I'm doing now. We use uh, uh, Latex's formatting convention. So the underscore means lowercase and the curly brackets means lowercase everything between the curly brackets. So I do that and I now have that name for the parameter. And then I attach that to a Ravel. And at the moment, at this point, I can simply hit recalculate, which is up here. And that will, as we call it, populate the Ravel. So the data that's stored in here, which has information on 48 countries or groups of countries. I presume that's five uh, types of units, breaks or no breaks, market or uh, non-market value, or what they call nominal value, and then uh, and that's 322 quarters. Some of which get lost because they're blank, by the way. Um, so that's the, that if I hit the recalculate key, those dimensions all turn up here. Now the first stage of working on the data Ah, and I haven't done what I like to do, which I'll go back and do, go back to the import CSV, and that's change these verbose column names to something shorter. So if you click in the um, name, the name section of the file import, you get another little window that lets you go and, uh, it's, it gives you a default, but you can go and change that to something, ah, hang on a second, uh, that was me pressing the key at the wrong point. Uh, that can happen when you when you go outside the window and you've, what you think, you think you're typing in the window there, you're actually typing in the um, uh, text itself and you get a, a problem thrown up. So that, and there's another little issue there. There is actually a name stored there, but the program's not showing it. This is the sort of stuff we have to go through and test and find bugs in. And in a release version, you'd make sure this stuff, as much of this stuff as you could get rid of was gone in what we're giving to you right now then that, that, that hassle will turn up occasionally. I've also done, I really have done a good job here, haven't I? What I've done uh, by clicking there is I've managed to trigger Minsky Ravel regarding all of this stuff as data when the data actually starts over here. So if that ha happens, I've first of all turned off all the check boxes up here by that action, and then I had the, the data starting way over here, which it wasn't data. So if I click in this particular cell, or this cell, or that cell, that says start importing from that point. So this is now going to say the, the quarter dimension starts here and goes horizontally. Uh, then I want to bring in the sector that does the borrowing, so that's where the sector is now turning up there again. Uh, I want the lending sector, and I'll just make this lender. Uh, the valuation, the word valuation is fine. Uh, so just, just the enter key on the word valuation that, that becomes, oh sorry, I've got to click the label up here. Uh, unit type, that's a bit verbose, so I'll go there and make that unit. Uh, type of adjustment, that again is a bit, whoops, hang on, there I go again. Click over here, click up here again, you bring it in, and then go for adjustment. Actually, I'm glad I'm making some mistakes because this, this sort of thing might happen to you. 
uh, when you're using the program the first time and you know what the hell's gone in. So uh, you can recover from those mistakes. They're not fatal. Uh, the data is still there. Okay, so I'm bringing in uh, country with a label of country. You can see down here, uh, where have I got country? I've got borrowing sector, for example, down here. It's quite verbose. There's borrowers country, just too verbose. Click on import. And now the names are shorter, though the actual, uh, the, the words that are used for the entries on each element is still quite verbose. At some stage, we'll let you edit those. At the moment, you're stuck with the long names that are used uh, by the person who put the data together. So now what I want to do is start doing some reductions here because, again, this is too much information. Um, so I, if I drag all these the selector dots inside the inner circle, then I get the entire data uh, structure. That's the whole seven dimensions of the data. So it's got both types of lenders. All, all lenders are just banks. As it happens, I just want the, the all sectors lending. The bank, there's only a tiny amount of data that's put down just for banks, so this just selects the, the data which is available for all the countries of when the lender is either a bank or a non-bank or whatever that is meant by by the, um, by the way the BIS is to find the data. Uh, I, but I'm pressing the up arrow key to go from inside the circle to the first value outside the circle. Uh, you can use the mouse as well, but we've made it fast to navigate by being able to use the arrow key rather than the mouse to move up and down, and this lets you do some dynamic, uh, effectively animations um, uh, when you've got the data loaded inside the program. Now we make huge use of the right-click menu, and one thing we have here is to pick the slices. And as it happens, there's almost nothing in the database using this purchase price parity evaluation of, of the uh, GDP, and it really stuffs up. It's such a long string; I prefer to get rid of it. If I hold the control key down and press click on the mouse, then I un unselect that and I'm just going to get these three you know, unique data sets coming in domestic currency, including conversion, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that's a, a purchase price parity issue. Percentage of GDP in US dollar. Then under sectors, there is a lot of aggregation going on here as well. So again, I'll go for pick slices and the government data is very badly organized. It's organized in a way that suits a data entry person rather than data analysis. So to make it simple, I'm getting rid of that one and I'm getting rid of the non-financial sector which adds together uh, the households, corporations and the government into one unit and get rid of the aggregation of private non-financial sector as well. So what I'm bringing across now is just the information on household debt and corporate debt and the sum of those two is total private sector debt and that's what I'll be working with in this demo. So I've got that, click on OK. The valuation, I just want it to be, uh, hang on, the valuation, market value. There's another one called nominal value. That's exclusively used for government debt and it's, it's a jumble. Uh, some of the government debt has market value, some has nominal and some has both. You've got to do a lot of work to get the government data together out of this database and I'll leave that for another exercise. So I've got it down to four dimensions now. I've got all the quarters, all the countries, uh, the units I need to take a look at and the, and the two private sectors and that's done the data reduction for me. Um, so I'll go back to seeing it at normal scale rather than full scale uh, and I'll bring in two more rubbles and just select this and drag it down a bit and then attach a wire from the output port of that input rubble to, the, to these two. I'll explain why I'm doing two in a moment and hit recalculate and there you see the, uh, the sectors. Now, sometimes that won't happen if you find it doesn't actually display the next ravel along and then attach a chart to the output of that ravel and that will force it to recalculate. Anyway, um, let's just take, let's just play with this for a moment. So I'll bring a chart in and I'll attach the top ravel to that. And now if I hit the recalculate key, then you're going to see, uh, trying to do it, the Rebels are doing his best trying to pull all the data out there because you've got numerous pieces of information. So let's narrow it down, but also, first of all, sort. So if I, you know, we will make this automatic in a future release, but um, there's, no, there's no sorting done automatically to the data when it comes in. So I'm going to go through to the access properties, sort forward on each of these data entries. And that just means for a start, the dates will be in the right order, so it's worth doing this. Access properties, sort, forward. 
All right, um, now let's so let's look at percentage of GDP. So if I use the arrow, I'm now pointing at the unit arrow. So I press the up arrow key. First of all, it goes to domestic currency, D first, then percentage of GDP. So we're starting to make a bit more sense over here on the other chart. Then um, I want to now look at, say, the United States. Let's drag it right down to the end here. That's the United States. So that is corporate and household debt for the United States as a percentage of GDP from when the data starts. And that's uh, sometime in uh, 1945 or thereabouts, I think. And I may want to put a, 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 a legend on the chart here, as well as other things. So let's call this uh, debt to GDP. Uh, and then bottom being time, and the vertical axis being percent of GDP. And then let's put a legend in there. Now we don't do legends well at the moment. Uh, you can click in here and make it smaller, but it's a pain. Okay, uh, I'm trying to click and bring about. You've got to see, I'm, I'm moving the whole thing. Summer inside here. This has been a bit of a bane. Oh, there we go. Okay, now for some reason I'm now moving that around. And then I want to also click somewhere that I managed to make it smaller, and it's a pain. Uh, we will fix that up, but at the moment that's one of the limitations. You're supposed to be able to do this easily, but obviously it is not easy because I can't work out how to do it. It tends to be luck. Oh, there we go. Luck applies. So I can now make it smaller. And let's move now and see if I can actually move the location again. Nah. Yeah, well, as I said, it's beta software, so these things happen, and we'll, we'll replace that at some point. Um, notice these arrows coming out here, that lets you resize a chart, that works fairly well. Uh, and if you right-click, you have, as well as options, you have pen styles, and that lets you change the uh, line colour and the line width, and also whether there's dashes or not. So I'll make this, say, three points for the households in terms of width, and two points for the... Um, uh, corporates and may have a dash line inside there. Okay, so that's now. Uh, so if you wanted to get that information out of the original file yourself, you'd be working bloody hard. Um, it'd take a long time to, you know, either set up a pivot table to do this inside Excel. Not all that long, but longer than what I've done here for uh, uh, for Ravel. Uh, or you'd be really working hard to choose the right columns turning the data into a table, blah, 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 blah. One thing you couldn't do in a hurry is this. And what that's doing is compressing and giving you the sum of the, uh, of the data uh, across the two sectors. That's adding together uh, corporate debt and household debt. And uh, set next aggregation. Oh, cool. This is, I haven't actually seen this yet. Uh, set aggregation. Uh, let's make this the average and see what happens. Yeah. So that's now the average of the two sectors. Uh, I'll go back and put, make it onto the uh, set aggregation, make it the, to the sum. And okay, what's happened there? Ah, it's on one value only. Let's go back up here. That's the two. That's the sum of the two. And if I set the aggregation to be the average, uh, then let's see what happens here. Let's try access properties set aggregation average. Hmm. <laughs> set next aggregation, try average there. Ah. That's both. Now, oh, well, I'll have to work that out a bit myself later. Uh, see what's going on there. But that's, that's the sort of tool we're trying to add to the program. Certainly, summation works. So you go from having both households and non-financial corporations uh, as independent uh, lines, just doing this, and that does the adding. Well, now, now I'm seeing the average. OK, so I've got there. That's the average of the two sectors. Uh, so now I go back and say the next aggregation is going to be oh, the product. I don't want product. Next aggregation, sum. OK, pull it out here. Put that back inside here. And then, boom, and I get sum. OK, OK. It takes me a while sometimes to work out Russell's protocols. Uh, but that's the idea. So summing, um, notice because it's on one point, then it's only showing that one data series and you don't get the legend there. Uh, that's non-financial corporations, that's households. Uh, just even looking at it, you can see that the, the, the corporate debt does follow the boom and bust cycle that Minsky speaks about. 
that the household sector looks to me like a Ponzi scheme. Uh, you know, uh, and when you look the two together, and I find this quite fascinating with the Australian data when I first looked at it, uh, the lending to the household sector took off during the recession of the 1990s, uh, largely because I think the private, the, the banks had given up, they, they saturated the household sector as much as they could do, so they started lending to the, uh, the saturated the corporate sector, so they started lending to the household sector in the middle of a recession. That's actually back here about, uh, let's say about 92 about here. So the lending takeoff, which I thought would happen after the crisis, not happened right in the middle of it. The corporate sector was deleveraging. Um, the banks started selling debt to the household sector. Okay, so as you can see, uh, I, I can now just go through each of the countries in the database and see the information pertinent to them on the chart. So again, that's something which would be extremely hard uh, working in a spreadsheet or even a, a pivot table. Now, what I'm going to now, I'll um, save this and move on to the next stage because one thing I want to take a look at is credit. Now, by credit, what I mean is the annual change in debt. That is actually the way accountants define credit. Economists get it stuffed up and call it the absolute level of debt, also call it credit. Two, two words for the same, con for two different, using two words for the same concept, which is the outstanding level of debt. The correct procedure is to treat debt as what you owe and credit as the change in what you owe per year, uh, or the change in the uh, level of debt per year. And I'll do that, uh, I'll save this first of all as a recording and then come back to that. It's going to be a long video, but I, I want to show one little trick. When I get credit, define, I can easily define credit now from the data I've got here, but I can't define credit as a percentage of GDP because though the types of data inside here include uh, US dollar and domestic currency, uh, so that's debt and domestic currency, you don't have any data for GDP and domestic currency. But because this has both domestic currency and percentage GDP, then if I defined, if I divide domestic debt in domestic uh, debt in domestic currency by the debt to GDP ratio, I get the GDP in nominal currency. So that's a little trick that would be very hard to do in any other program. I'll show you how easy it is to do it in Ravel in the next the next part of this recording. All right, let's keep on going here. So I'm going to drag this chart down here and delete this. Why? If I right click, I get an option. Why? Whenever you see a dot on a line, by the way, you'll select the dot, you select the line. That's there so you can curve it. If you click somewhere else, you can curve it in another location, uh, which, which now makes for better looking charts if you want to show. Uh, hang on, oops, okay. Uh, if you want to uh, you know, get something to uh, approach a, uh, another object smoothly rather than having a line overriding something else, that's the, the role of the, uh, the wires there. But I was going to delete the wire and then attach that down here because what I'm about to do uh, takes advantage of uh, Ravel's capability to do mathematics across entire arrays of data rather than just a single cell numbers which is the Excel uh, standard. So what I first have to do, let's get rid of this, pardon me, it's getting in the way. Uh, what I first have to do is define a variable and I'm going to, on this one I'm going to select uh, the unit is going to be percentage of GDP but the unit here is going to be domestic currency. And I want to first of all set it up so that these two ravels are locked on the same information. So I've got Hong Kong up there, no country at all down the bottom. So I firstly click and drag and I select both of those uh, ravels. And then I choose, well, you should be choosing lock uh, selected ravels, but because they're coming from the same data source, uh, it, it says select specific handles instead. And I'm going to make the two rebels exactly the same, except for the unit that they choose. Um, we're going to this. This is a, a clumsy part of the program at the moment. We're going to go to a much better way of choosing how to lock what are called what, what either handles, as we call them, or dimensions or axes. A better way of doing that. But this this, this is it still works at the moment. So I've got this. There, these are now on the same country. So if I move the country here up to the first country, which will be advanced economies. Uh, or reporting country, you can see that what I'm doing up on one happens to the one down the bottom as well. So they're locked together like that. Equally, if I rotate, uh, if I do this to move it by country rather than quarter, then that happens to both of them as well. We're going to make that slightly more flexible in a future version, but I'll, but I'll get there to that later. So I've got this is on domestic currencies. I'll choose this one to be percent of GDP. 
Um, so I, and I can now attach these to labels over here, it's actually variables. So I'm going to say this is debt dominated in domestic currency. And for want of a better symbol, I'll use the dollar sign. Uh, then you get a window to define over here. I don't actually want to make any more definitions here. I press the escape key or press cancel to get out of there and then I can attach this to that um, variable. It hasn't been recalculated yet but I've hit the recalculate key. You find this now has information on the 122 quarters uh, by two uh, sectors uh, by 48 countries. Now in fact I don't um, Oh, I'll, I'll, actually, I'll, I'll get to this next point first of all. So a similar thing here. I want to have debt divided by, and I'm going to go low, uh, subscript GDP, just to make it look a bit better in formatting terms, uh, in percentage terms. Click on OK, press the escape key, and now I've got debt divided by GDP, and I've got debt up here. If I divide one by the other, I'm going to get GDP in domestic currency. And I've made a deliberate error here because when I do the recalculate, which again is this key up here, we've got to bring a shortcut key for that. This will have three dimensions when it only reads only needs two. Um, because since I've got two sectors inside there, then I'm doing two calculations, one using the data in uh, household debt, the other using the data in uh, corporate debt, both giving the same results. So the sensible thing there is just to collapse the sector data, recalculate again, and what I get over here is GDP is the data on 322 quarters, 448 countries, which is what I was after. And I'll do one more thing here, which um, I might be doing this on the wrong side, <laughs> we'll soon find out, uh, but I want to hang on to that definition regardless of what I do to these rabbles. So we have this lock device here, and this is very new. We haven't actually um, uh, produced a, a decent graphical object for it as yet. So if I just attach the output of the division to the input of the GDP, then I find I've still got those correct dimensions over here. If I right click and choose lock, that now remains as, uh, hang on, lock. Double click. Uh oh. Oh, what's oh, great. Yeah. Well, that was fun. What went wrong? Um, if I was doing a promotional video, I'd probably jump over that bit and you wouldn't even see it. Uh, it's, uh, it's not, I'd never do that anyway. Um, but uh, the point is that the lock object, which I was trying to show off last time around, is a new is a new entry into Minsky's like. Oh, Ravel's lexicon, and um, one we, we, at the moment it expects to be preceded by another Ravel. I try to lock it on the wrong side of the Ravel. If you go back and take a look at that part of the video, you'll see I had this operation over here, and then I had a GDP domestic, and I put a lock in, and I tried to lock it, and bang, the program crashed ungraciously. It went right out to the operating system. Um, so one little uh, suggestion I make uh, in this situation, I call it the Tammany Hall, Tammany Hall rule of, uh, of, of computer software, and that is save early and save often. So I should have saved it beforehand and I didn't. I had to recreate this one. And I'm going a bit on memory as well. I can't go back and take a look at the video before I continue recording this one. But one little thing I've added in here is a percentage operator. I'll just actually scale in full scale here and show what's going on. So what you've got down here is data on debt as a percentage of GDP, and I can just graph that very easily by whacking it here and hit the recalculate button. And currently it's by country. So you know, I could show uh, that way. I could show the evolution of um, private debt over time. Why don't I do that? See, at the moment I've got all, selecteds, uh, all sectors selected and all countries uh, over time. But what I might want to do is say, well, what was it like uh, back in, let's see, 1940 Q2, no data, boom, boom, these are the first ones that are blank. And once I finally get to the stage of having some data here, which will be after the Second World War, I think we'll find. Hmm. Quite late, but oh, there we go. Okay, so Argentina's turning up. 
uh, with data. Interesting choice. Uh, 1950, now come on, there's got to be some American data inside there by now. Let's just see. Uh, Argentina, okay, why am I only getting Argentina? Oh, okay, pardon me. Didn't notice up there, I've made that mistake. So there are all the countries, uh, the, all the countries in the database. Uh, and as I go through, um, go forward in time, I'm graphing the absolute level of private debt. Now, that'd take a while in any other program, which is one of the reasons I'm, um, I designed Ravel in the first place and why I'm a bit um, um, proud of it. Now, uh, let's go back where I was beforehand. And what I want to do is have this graphed over time. And there what I've got are the, for as many, uh, I think that we, we graph 16 data series at most with any one input because there's 43 countries here. Um, but that's the data on debt to GDP for all those countries. And if I drag this down to being on the last one, which happens to be United States, then there's the aggregate debt to GDP, private sector debt to GDP ratio for America. Anyway, the point of the long rave was that this is currently stored as 180, uh, just because it's where percentages are, which is 1.8 times GDP. So if I divide this into, oh, and I've got, uh, okay, it's my, pardon me, I've got to rename that. Let's go and choose re, rename here. And it's not as percentage terms, that's as, as it is, uh, rather not a dollar terms, percentage terms. Okay, um, so now I'm deciding this into domestic debt and domestic currency which is dividing it uh, by, not by this last point here, not by 1.6, which is what it should be doing, but 160. So it's gonna come out as the wrong number. Uh, so what I do is simply feed the output through a percentage operator, which multiplies it by 100. So that reverses the uh, fact that over here, I'm dividing by 100 too much. Uh, here I put it through a percentage calculator and I get the result on the other side. Um, you'll see that currently I've got quarter coming out there. Let's go back because I, I, I've got the capacity to control those quarters. If I come over to GDP, I've just got 322 dimensions because I'm working just the United States. Let's drag that back up here again. And there are the countries. And I've still got, oh, no, I've got 43 by, yeah, okay, we're not working all that well. Let's unlock this, okay, and then relock it. And that should remain, uh, oh, pa okay, pardon me, yeah. This, this is varying depending upon what I've got down here. I'm doing a pretty bad job of explaining this, aren't I? Okay. Um, the lock is designed so that you can get a particular result from a set of ravels and then store that permanently. So I want to store permanently uh, debt to GDP as the, uh, or rather the G GDP in domestic currency as that for all countries uh, in the world. So I've got to make sure my original uh, data back here is by all countries, by all quarters with percentage of GDP down here, and by all countries, by all quarters, with domestic currency up there. Hit the recalculate, and then I find I've got the full information over here. That is then stored in GDP domestic, uh, in domestic currency, and now I lock that object, and now I know that this is going to be what I need, uh, which is domestic currency information on, on uh, uh, GDP for every country in the BIS database. Um, I think that's a pretty cool trick, being able to do that with one operation. And the other cool trick, I'll just save again before I stuff up once more, uh, is that the equations tab is keeping track of the equations as I write them. So this is saying data import, uh, that should actually say equals the file name rather than equals zero. But there's no operation being done on data import. In fact, that's data import has now disappeared. That was the default name of BIS debt. And then it's say debt to GDP is what's imported by data import, and so the same, but it's a subset, that's what these symbols here stand for, and GDP in, do, in domestic dollar terms is the locked output of that operation. Uh, but it should be showing that, um, that this is equal to, I now I found another flaw, great. Okay, okay, let's just, uh, let's try doing it this way. Is why one reason why I wanted to get it into your, into your hands. I'm just going to uh, actually, actually just delete that wire. <sighs> Make that over here, delete that wire. Boom. Now, having done it that way, this, this may be something we need to, to work on for the next version. Anyway, come over here and check the equations. And that is another saying the GDP 
in domestic currency is equal to debt in domestic currency divided by the debt to BDD ratio processed by a percent. That's a pretty ugly looking percent sign. That's just come out, out of the, uh, the graphics library we're using to write this as a bitmap. But you can also choose to export this um, as the export the canvas and you can export the actual graphics you see there, a PDF file of the same, a postscript file of the same, and down the bottom, MATLAB, so you can put this into a MATLAB program, and LaTeX. And LaTeX is the mathematical formatting language which you can use to document uh, what your equations are. So, and that, that generates something that looks better than what you see on the equations tab here. All right, so where have I got to? So I've got G uh, GDP and domestic currency is that calculation properly defined and then I'm locking the output. Uh, so I'm just going to, uh, for the heck of it, I'll just call this GDP, uh, well, <sighs> that is a dilemma. At some point, we're gonna to have to make the lock key work on either side of the, of the Ravel operator. So play with it. It's the sort of thing which uh, Russell will be doing, spending his time coding up uh, as the program evolves. So I'll just take a copy of that and uh, I'll just edit that name and make that domestic and I'll just put uh, CU for currency. Bit ugly. Um, up there. Currently, yeah, there we go. So that, that I know is going to remain with the um, uh, 43 countries, uh, whatever I do over here in terms of moving this around so if I want to go let's, let's just take that out so hang on I'll put a graph there so you can see what I'm doing or see the results of what I'm doing and let's compare that to this one hope I get a different result you never know when you're testing your software okay hit the recalc they're both giving exactly the same thing as you can see you can actually even just in this simple little illustration here, you can see the impact of COVID. Uh, that's uh, a single country, but you can see that obviously GDP has gone down in domestic currency terms for that country. It's probably Argentina with its currency. I'm not really, not really sure. Okay, so what if I now move this to a single country by pressing the up arrow key, let's go to Argentina. Um, okay, I have found a problem with the lock. It's not actually locking. Okay, so Russ, we've got to work on that one. Unlock, relock. But the idea, uh, which will be there at some stage, is that the lock keeps a permanent state of some operation you've done. So that is a bit of a um, near pain from uh, the developmental stage of the software. But, um, oh, look at that. That's the inflation and deflation. Okay, for Argentina. So I'm stuck with a few problems there. Uh, so we'll work on the lock and make it work better over time. Obviously, it's not locking right now. Okay, let's just go and do some work with this anyway. So what I've now got, um, so the, the, the long and the short of that is lock is an operator which will be useful in the f future, but isn't quite up to um, operation standing, first of all. But what I'm going to do now is take copies of these two variables, bring them down here. So I've got debt de in domestic currency, um, and GDP in domestic currency. Now we've already got debt as a percentage of GDP, so I don't need to regenerate that. What I want to do is generate uh, credit, which is the annual change in private debt. So we have a number of, of operators. I'll just actually drag this off so we, we ha I can have a few of them showing up on screen uh, at any one time. So each time you click on one of these, you can choose an operator and then move on to the next operator. So that's using the plus key. Um, but if you want to have a permanent record of them, so you don't have to hit the drop down all around and just tear them off, and then this one is sitting for permanent reference there. That's a difference operator. So I feed debt and domestic currency through a difference operator. And uh, this is not being done in a particularly graphical fashion at the moment. And here we have another bug that is supposed to be giving me the two dimensions which are available, which are quarter and country. So it's not doing that. So again, one of the reasons why this is developmental software rather than finished. But I'll go for quarter and I want to look at the change in debt, a change in, in, in debt over four quarters. Now that should work, let's see. And now I want to divide that 
by, uh, well that, that I'm going to define as credit, so I'll just do that first of all. You can just type the variable name anywhere you want. Credit, I won't bother saying it's in domestic currency. Um, actually, I could do that, that might make the naming more consistent, so I'll just actually do that and I'll, wherever this one turns up, debt and domestic currency, uh, well, we're in, no, no, leave it, leave it as it's okay. Debt and domestic currency. Uh, and the ch taking that in the process, that is the credit. It hasn't been recalculated. Let's hit the recalculate key. And now I should have something which is, have, yeah, 318 dimensions, which is 318 quarters, less than the quarters in debt itself because, uh, because it's over four quarters, there's a difference. You don't get any entries of the first four entries. That's again, if you did this on a spreadsheet, if you did it, you'd need to make sure you started from the fourth or the fifth entry in the uh, debt because your previous entries would be either zero or null. Uh, Ravel just takes care of that straight away. So that's credit. And if I divide credit, whoops, if I divide credit by GDP and put that through a percent operator, which is this one here, um, then I have a credit as a percentage of GDP. So credit and uh, I credit, I'll do the same thing, it's the same sort of formatting, divided by GDP uh, as a percentage, which it is. And then wire that up. And then now what I've got is something where I can graph uh, Debt is a percentage of GDP against credit. So I'll just take a copy of that and take a copy of this. And now it should be, I think I'll put the one below the other. If I graph them, then on one graph I should get both debt levels and credit levels uh, for whichever countries I've selected. And because I've got all countries selected at the moment, I'll get lots of countries. Let's just do that. Yep, uh, but if I now go to say, let's look at the United States, then there's debt and credit for the United States over the last uh, 50 or so years. So this is an il illustration of what you can do with Ravel that I think it'd be a damn sight harder in any other program and certainly uh, not easy to document as Ravel's doing. Else again, I'll save that before I check anything else and see what's going on. Uh, so there are my equations now, including the credit calculations there as well. And let's just do a bit of fine tuning. This is still a pretty ugly graph, so I'll just actually put some... The graphs are always ugly. We're going to do a lot of work on graphs. Okay, uh, but let's say debt and credit. Uh, and then have this, you know, the date here, and percent of GDP as the entry on the other side. Okay, so having done that, I want that. I would want that in the final presentation. And what we're doing gradually is creating additional tabs up here. We'll have one at one stage, which will be a display tab. So, only what you put on the display tab will actually turn up, and that when you try to document your uh, your work. Um, but at the moment, we just got one uh, separate ones for variables, plots, and godlies. Now, plots at the moment has got all the whole lot. Um, so, I think I can remove that, and I can remove that, and I can remove that. And now the one plot that I've got is that one. So uh, we can't, as at the moment, you can't resize these. You're stuck with whatever you've done over on the wiring tab. I'll just actually change a few things. Let's make the pen style slightly different. So I'll make this three points. Make that two. Ah, not twenty-one points. Two points will do fine. And two points. Two points there. Okay, slightly better looking chart. Um, so, but now if I now start going through the country, that's the United States, that's the UK, that's Turkey. No, you can see Turkey's financial problems turning up there. Uh, Thailand should be the next one. There's the Asian financial crisis back in the 90s. So, uh, this is some of the power of, of Ravel. Um, what I'd really like you to do is make extensive use of it, uh, put it through other sorts of data. I'm just using economic data because A, that's what I'm interested in, B, that's what I've got. Um, but I'd love to see it being used by people working in corporations to do profit and loss calculations, uh, you know, product sales by, by, by division, by salesperson, that sort of thing, uh, with real data rather than the toy stuff I used a couple of days ago from, uh, from a uh, pivot table uh, course. Um, 
So um, yeah, that is that is the program, and um, we'll uh, I'm, I'm I'm giving it away to patrons first of all. I want to get out as widely as possible. I'd like to do a bit of viral marketing here. Uh, if that viral marketing goes far as majors looking at it and saying we want to check this out, that's fine. Um, but uh, if you have colleagues that you think might find this useful, first of all ask them to, if they want a copy, to sign up to my Patreon page or Minsky's Patreon page. If they don't want to do that, then ask them to, um, if it's okay, if they, you, you can give them the link for them to download and take a look at it. Um, we'd prefer to get their email as well so we can do some, uh, some marketing once we have a final product. If they object to that, give it to them anyway. Uh, the thing is, in future versions, we'll set it up in such a way that you have to be a patron to get any versions after this. So this particular hassle with the lock key is going to remain there in this, uh, in this iteration. We'll hopefully eliminate that so the lock key A won't cause the program to crash, B can be put on either side of uh, a rabble, and C works. Um, but we'll, uh, but so you will see this over the next uh, six months to a year. I imagine we'll put out a, a new release every one or uh, every fortnight or every month, something like that. So um, yeah, take it away. Uh, but one more thing, the size of the canvas, you can see me clicking between here and here all the time. This one just fills the current window, whatever window size you have. This goes back to the default size. The, uh, you can change the scaling by using your uh, scroll key uh, or by choosing a zoom level as well just by pressing the plus or the minus keys. Uh, the actual design canvas here is enormous. Um, my screen is 4000 by 2000 pixels. The design surface is 100,000 by 100,000 pixels. So you could put a gigantic amount of information here. That applies to Minsky as, as well. And we make use of, we haven't done grouping very well at the moment. The, you can group objects in Minsky or Ravel, but the grouping tends to, when we when you unscale, have, if you scale something down after you've grouped it and then rescale it up, it gets all jumbled. We haven't got the, uh, that working out all well. But we do have a thing called bookmarks. So if you wanted to do a lot of work defining uh, data objects, but you didn't want to have that visible in what you presented, then you can just insert a bookmark. I'll go down to here, for example. And what you do is you, I'm holding the shift key down now, and uh, and using the arrow key to relocate the screen. I'll just move those two out of the way. Now if I choose a bookmark at this position, let's call it calcs, and then go back to the original level and then say take me back to calcs, then I move to that individual spot. And that's just on a tiny part of my screen. That could actually be the 90,000th by 90,000th pixel somewhere else. So you can pull this stuff out of the way. You don't have to put the actual calculations in somebody's face when they're uh, looking at your uh, presentable output. As I said, at some point there'll be a uh, publication tab up here as well, and you better put text and the graphics and which calculations you wish to show on that, and that can be the, the presentation tool. Uh, just go back to the full scale again. Uh, what I want to do, of course, is put this inside a, a Word document to um, document the, the post I'll put up on Patreon. So I'm just putting this in an SVG, which is the vector graphics format. And then if I go to Word and start writing the post that I'll cover this in, um, then I just have to get to the object and drag it across. And there's uh, the beginning. Let's make that full scale. That's the beginning of writing the blog post that's going to give you, uh, hang on. I'll go to the whole page, no page width. Okay, so there's a fairly presentable uh, version of the calculations that I've done as part of this uh, video, and I'll now shut up and start writing up the post and put the link up hopefully in a couple of hours. And what I forgot to include in that little presentation is the sheet tool. So I'll just actually make it back to the normal scale and bring a sheet in. Um, and then uh, let's see, let's attach debt to GDP for that uh, and do so and boom and then hit the recalc and what you get is the, just the very very beginning of the data. At the moment of course this data is uh, just for the country of Thailand and there happens to be no data there and that's great you get to see the initial blank rows nothing else. 
Um, what we intend doing in a future release, this will take a while uh, to develop, is we want to have the axes of uh, uh, the ravels in, embedded into the sheet and also embedded into the uh, graph. So you can therefore change what you see just by changing the dot selector that's here, which will be on one of these, ditto on the sheet, will make it three-dimensional as well, so you can scroll through three-dimensional data. We haven't done that yet, so if you want to do something useful, just to, uh, put another rabble on the way. And uh, let's see, so I do that, uh, data GDP in through here, uh, feed that onto the chart. At the moment, that's going to be, uh, again, the same thing, just blank. Uh, but what I can do, I'll just drag this up a bit and make it a bit easier to see. Put it over here, actually. Uh, your screens are normally wider than they are long, but uh, let's just do this. Pardon me, stuffing around here a bit. I do enjoy playing with the playing with the program. Uh, okay. Now, what I can do here is right-click and choose Axis Properties Toggle Calipers. We didn't go a lot with whether these over time, but this is our way of selecting a range of data. And as I mentioned, this will be embedded into the streets as well as uh, uh, embedded into in, in the uh, in Ravels itself. So the idea here is a bit, bit like a scroll bars on steroids because you can actually just say, oh, I want to see a range, say, from... Oh, let's look at the beginning of the... Um, uh, post the the golden age of capitalism start in 51 go through to about uh, say 66 and change the country across one where I know we have data which is going to be the USA so there's the USA's debt levels at that stage and then if you want to see it further on then you slide you select at this end and drag this one over here and then we, we'll see from 2011 on it gets rather hard to see because it gets to be such a small scale, but you can just zoom in and say, well, let's actually look, say, at the last, uh, let's start from 2018. It's a little, you get, you know, these things are overriding each other. There's always an issue with scaling when you're working with a graphics program. Okay, so now we can see uh, the, imp the level of private debt uh, in the USA, and you can see the impact of COVID pretty savagely from 50% 150, 153, 160, and of course that's almost all as it turns out happening in the uh, corporate sector. So if we drag this out, we've now got um, um, household debt, debt. that's uh, non-financial sector, and you can see the increase in debt there. And if you say, let's just uh, not, not break them down, then that should have given me, uh, hang on, look over here. Um, I'll, uh, I'll move this one, give me both. Okay, so there's, there's you know, your comparison for uh, debt to GDP ratios for both households and the corporate sector uh, between 2017 and 2021, as far as the data goes. So, um, yeah, so at the moment you can, you can get a, get a sub-selection, take a look at it. Later versions will, will enable, as I said, we'll have the, the, both the, ax, the axis and the selected dot and everything else integrated in the... Um, frame of the uh, spreadsheet and the frame of the graph um, and will also enable multiple calipers. So if you wanted to have a chart showing what's happening now versus what was happening in uh, 19... Let's say you wanted to compare the Great Depression, uh, 1920 to 1940, compare that to the Great Recession, uh, 1990 to 2010, then you could have two calipers and they would show the data turning up on one, one sheet. Little things like that that are impossible, not impossible, but very hard to do, very cumbersome to do with the spreadsheet. It'll be quite straightforward in a later version of Ravel. And I'll now shut up and let you guys start playing with it.